Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Oregon Rural Health Conference presented by the Oregon Office of Rural Health. My name is Rose Locklear and I'm a program manager at the Oregon Office of Rural Health. And before we get started, um, I will be moderating the session today. But before we get started, I would like to thank our partners um, without their continued support during these difficult times. Um, it would, wouldn't be possible to have this event and to offer it to you all at no charge. So thank you to our gold partners, All Care, Oregon Rural Health Association, our club <laughs> partners, Eastern Oregon Coordinated Care Organization, Oregon Association of Hospital and Health Systems, the River House on the Deschutes, RQI, <clears throat> our Copper Partners, Westcom, American College of Education, and Inquisic. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Before we get started, um, a few virtual conference instructions. Uh, first off, you should have received an email with a link to our conference app. Use this app to visit our partners' booths um, enter, you can enter to win prizes, network with others, and share photos of um, your hometown. Um, your audio and video have been muted for this session. If you have questions, please enter them as we go along uh, in this presentation in the Q&A um, box over to your right. There is a Q&A button at the lower uh, right uh, bottom of your screen if it hasn't populated. Um, I will ask your questions to the presenters at the end of this session. If you have any technical questions or you're experiencing issues, you can also ask your questions there in that Q&A as well. <clears throat> There's at the upper right hand corner of your screen, you'll see a few um, boxes that allow you to change the view of, um, of pre this presentation. We recommend the floating view for the best experience during the session today. <clears throat> These slides, the recording of this session will be posted shortly after the conference. And if we don't get to your question, your question will also be posted with these slides. Next slide, please. The session evaluation, we will um, <clears throat> be sending out an evaluation. You'll get a link to this. Um, Please don't forget to complete the session. If you are uh, getting CEs, you absolutely have to complete the evaluation. It gives you a chance to win a $100 gift card. And really, it's a way to help us improve. Um, in this virtual day and age, we like as much feedback as possible. And next slide, please. So I'm going to pass the, the baton over to Chip here, and he's going to introduce our speakers today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rose. Uh, this is Dr. Chip Taylor. I'm a family physician and um, residency program director here in Roseburg, Oregon. Uh, retired Navy captain, I served as the operations chief for our COVID response in Roseburg, which we'll describe today. I'd like to introduce our speakers today and have them just wave and say hi so you'll get a chance to see who they are. Um, Casey Bolton is a retired Army Colonel, and uh, he is the uh, CEO at Aviva Health, a large federally qualified health center. Casey served as the incident commander for our uh, response. Casey, would you just say something? So, good, good morning. Uh, happy to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Great. Dr. Bob Danahofer is our public health officer. He's a practicing pediatrician. Um, kindly old Dr. Bob might be the best way to describe him in our community, long-term uh, practicing physician. And he is really uh, uh, the star of our uh, show today. Bob, would you uh, wave your arm and say hi? Thank you, you're way too kind. <laughs> and then the, the, the other unsung hero is um, Dr. Uh, Tanvir Bokhari. He is a uh, Pakistani trained um, internal medicine doc serving as the VP for quality for our CCO here in Roseburg. And he was the deputy operations chief and um, uh, brought lots of skills that I don't necessarily have to the table. Um, Tanvir is not on video this morning, 
Andrew, would you just say hi? Hello, everyone. Thank you for the intro, Chip. Okay. And then the last person on our list is Betsy Boyd Flynn, who's the convener from the Oregon Academy of Family Physicians, uh, without whose uh, sponsorship and, and uh, vision, we would not be here talking to you. So thank you, Betsy. Would you just say hi? Hello, everybody. Thanks for thanks for that those kind words, Chip. That, that and I am perfectly content to be in the background while you awesome people talk about um, the work that you've done to protect your community. So thanks. Great. So next slide, please. So so the the topic for today is integrating primary care and public health, and we're using the COVID nineteen response as the model for that. For those of you who aren't aware, Douglas County is um, the 38th largest county in the United States, but only the fifth largest county in Oregon. Uh, we have more square acres and miles than the state of Connecticut, about 110,000 folks that we're responsible for, with the vast majority of those lying um, in the central part of the county along the I-5 corridor. Next slide. So, so um, in March, this was the headline for our local paper. Douglas County, one of the wor four worst counties to be in during the COVID-19 crisis. Based on things that we in rural health know, one, our patients are older, sicker, and poorer than our uh, uh, urban counterparts. And we, we have a relatively inelastic uh, healthcare system. We have what we have. It's hard to get people in and out. And, um, and so uh, they were predicting huge, huge scenarios of infected folks, 20% to 60% over six months. And thank heavens that did not occur. And I would like to say that probably that didn't occur um, due to luck, but also due to um, the strong work of the individuals and others in front of you. Um, next slide. So just to bring everyone up on the same page, March 25th didn't just happen out of the blue, there was a ramp up and, um, and Dr. Danahoff or Bob will tell us more about this um, because he really was the, the person who uh, uh, oversaw much of this preparation, which actually precedes this um, in his, his foresight about uh, pandemic response. But we had our first case in, in uh, Douglas County in March. Um, the state of emergency was care was uh, uh, set up. And then on the 15th of March, or the 25th of March, excuse me, the emergency operations center opened up and we were able to stand down and go into a more passive mode of response on the 30th of May. So our story is mostly about what happened between March 25th and May 30th. I'm going to go ahead and pass the baton to Casey Bolton, who was our incident commander who can talk about the big picture and a little bit about the fog of war that occurred in those first few days as we sought to create a response. Yeah, it was very foggy. <laughs> uh, I, I do want to say that that it's it's not common for uh, a county like Douglas County to reach out of its structure. They have emergency response staff. Uh, they have a full time emergency manager. Um, this this was a it's not a horse. It's a zebra sort of uh, issue or challenge for the county. And uh, Dr. Bob works closely with the commissioners on a daily basis and and. They determined that they needed a different kind of slant to how they approach the response. And so um, I, I was asked to come work at the county and help lead that team. It really was a more of a team. I was kind of uh, connecting the dots at, at a higher level. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And I want to talk a little bit about how uh, we sat down and tried to approach the response. And, and really, when this first kicked off, it had a lot of the feel of kind of uh, battlefield medicine. And that's that's my background before I uh, retired is, uh, you know, I ran hospitals in combat zones and, and you know, the planning piece of that really kind of the logistics side as well. So I, that was the lens I walked in going, wow, you know, we have time distance factors and so on. 
uh, for evacuation of these folks. We're, we need to track hotspots, all those sorts of things that really is, uh, and the speed of action, and I'll talk about that later, but just the need for tracking information in real time and then making decisions off of that, it just had that feel of battlefield medicine. And so I, I approached it that way and had to reach back uh, <clears throat> several times into that kit bag that I had learned in the military and, and bring that to the forefront. So the, the commissioners, we really need to neck down how we approach this. As we all know in medicine, um, you know, we when we triage, we we don't have certain criteria like what's your zip code as part of that. We take care of the sickest first sort of thing. And I, I needed to, to have them articulate to us as the team, uh, are you okay with that? What if someone from Lynn County drove down I-5 because they didn't have capacity in Albany and they needed to be seen, are you going to be okay with that? And so we really purposely walk through the, the tasks that we need to do. And so the wording is very specific as well, starting with minimizing the loss of life of Douglas County citizens. <clears throat> and then these other imperatives, and you can see it on the slide, if you've got the slide pulled up, but really we've, the, the system needed to be able to sustain itself. And at the first part of this, it just was happening so rapidly. We, we thought we were gonna get overwhelmed in about 20 days. Um, so, what do you do to protect the system? And one of the phrases I used to say to the folks is, you know, the Alamo is the hospitals. And so, kind of focusing on protecting the hospitals, trying to push as much out of the hospital that didn't need to be there, make sure they had the protective equipment and so on. And that's that next piece there is really the PPE needed to be centrally managed and uh, DPHN, Douglas Public Health Network did that kind of make sure that we were not wasting uh, PPE on things that were not necessary in the moment of that crisis. And then um, really kind of bringing everyone to the table and making sure each organization had skin in the game in terms of who's best at what from a, from a care system approach. And again, I had to reach back a little bit in my military days and think systems and just pretended in my mind that every asset in Douglas County that was medical worked for me and kind of built then that framework and then try to then reach out to those leaders. And it's about relationships as we all know, and just say, hey, I, can you play this role for us? And that's really what we did. That's how we built the plan uh, in, in simple terms. And then lastly, really kind of, uh, and we're still, some of the, these are all still in play right now. We're really kind of in a hiatus of the EOC is just making sure we could sustain things because we didn't know how long this was going to be. Uh, I guess I got the next slide, so we'll go to the next slide. So again, we had kind of two things going on at once, and I want to make sure that we that it's clear is that Douglas County has a hybrid public health model where uh, the county ha has contracted with a nonprofit that Dr. Danahoffer is a part of, that's the DPHN I mentioned before. They're the planning and, and to some degree action arm of public health. My organization, Aviva Health, we have some of that mission as well, uh, vaccinations and some other things. But you, if you can avoid the fight, as they say, the first way of defeating an ambush is knowing it exists. It's better to not fight the fight if you can avoid it. So that's, that's that battle for containment and understanding where those hotspots are for COVID and trying to get ahead of that and really uh, saturating that site and making sure we knew who talked to who and Bob and his team did all of that. Um, and so, they, and they were continuing to do that. So we had this simultaneous kind of preventive approach, as well as me ramping up the bigger system of the reaction sort of thing. And that's that second uh, column there. The health system is really how are we going to collectively uh, optimize our resources? And uh, you know, we there was a lot of there's there's still some unknowns, but there were a lot of unknowns at the start of who was going to suit up for the game and who wasn't and, and what resources they really had. And I think uh, I'll kind of stop there and maybe move on to the next slide uh, rather than get too much into the weeds there. 
So this, this is the transition to Dr. Bob telling us about that um, fight for containment. Um, Bob, perhaps you could start by providing some perspective and as you do so well, uh, uh, there was a huge amount of uncertainty um, and you, you, you were right on top of almost like a barometer trying to see which way the pressure was going for our system. And you've been doing that for a long time, even before we reached uh, this stage. Yeah, we had been prepared for this. So when this pandemic came, people said, oh, this is your first pandemic. But it's not the first, it was not the first rehearsal for a pandemic. Just we'd done that before. So if I can have the next slide. So public health in Douglas County is distinctly different from every other place in the state, and we would say from most places in the country. So public health in Douglas County is a public-private partnership. There are from some public parts to public health. There are enforcement duties, there are legislative duties that the public health needs to do, and the county retains that public health authority, but they have a uh, a part-time employee who's me as the public health officer and the rest of the work is done by our FQHC who provides clinical services, uh, women's health services, immunizations, sexually transmitted infections and so they do that work. Setting it up this way helps public health to, to work with primary care. We can't be separate from primary care. We have to be part of primary care because we have to share these patients. So sharing is deeply ingrained in our model. So we also had to set up a new not-for-profit, which is this Douglas Public Health Network, or DPHN, and they provide all the services that nobody else wants to touch. Case investigation, emergency preparedness, coordination of clinical services, phone out death certificates, all those kinds of things that really aren't clinical, but that public health needs to do. And when we formed five years ago, our board included the CEOs of our two local FQHCs, people from the hospital, people from the CCO, people from the IPA. And so basically what we had here is a group of medical leaders deciding how we would run public health. Their view was that infectious disease and preparedness needed to be our highest priorities. There are so many priorities in public health. Is it chronic diseases? Is it smoking? Is it obesity? We recognized early on that smoking and obesity would be there all the time when we needed to work with them, but that public health would really be challenged in the time of a pandemic or a cascading event. So we really focused as a group mostly on infectious disease and preparedness. We got a little crap for that because we were a little less involved in chronic disease and disease prevention. We had some great advantages. So I've been in town for 31 years and know most, most of the primary care people in town and still work in primary care. So when they say, well, public health doesn't really understand primary care, that just doesn't go anywhere in Douglas County. And we really have a history of sharing. I get so many calls from docs in town asking about public health things. And then I call people in town to help me. A kid with TB who needs to get treated, an adult with a rare disease, that I can ask our inf infectious disease people. So, so sharing was not something that we had to figure out when the pandemic came. Sh sharing was part of our DNA. And there was no competition for clinical services. So in many areas, public health and the private people uh, battle over, over patients and battle over assignments and whatever else. We don't do any clinical services as the county. And so there's no competition for clinical services and we're way past that. And then the not-for-profit structure of our Douglas Public Health Network gives us great flexibility in hiring. Many of the other areas in the state had to go through their somewhat antiquated ways of, of hiring people and took a long time to do it. We could hire people on the spot. And because we were a not-for-profit, we got a bunch of grants. And these grants allowed us to do some amazing things that if we were public health in the county, we may not have been able to do. Let me go to the next slide. So we understood that pand a pandemic or Cascadia were going to be the two things that were going to most stress public health sometime in the future. So for four years now, we've been doing these drive-through flu clinics. Basically, if you had to give a lot of vaccine quickly, this may sound familiar, if you had to give a lot of vaccine quickly, how would you do it? And so we've done it at the fairgrounds and at local fire stations where people have been able to drive through, get a free flu shot, and then leave. 
Actually, we're going to do it again this year, and Aviva is actually going to take the reins on doing that. But when we did those, we brought in about 30 organizations from the community, including Aviva, including Dr. Taylor, and, and lots of other people who helped us to run these. And I will tell you, the first time it was not that smooth, the second time was better, and by last year it was very smooth. And we were perfectly prepared then for what comes next. And I will tell you, we had great involvement from the very beginning, from the county, from our FQHCs, state preparedness helped, and the CCO helped. And we could do this at a time back in the last four years when there was no emergency. So the people from the state health could come down, we could do all the things in a quiet and kind of protected way so that when you had to do it under battlefield conditions, it got better. So we, so there was nothing particularly new in what we were doing. So we were able to very early establish in an incident command. So we started our incident command here on March the 7th, the county a little bit later than that. We were one of the very first. There are some counties who've not yet set up incident command for COVID. We were able early on to recognize that you needed to have a team that could do case investigation and contact tracing before there was any talk of that. We were able as our not-for-profit to hire somebody with long experience in the CDC tracking down sexually transmitted diseases in the last few cases of polio. And so we understood how important it was to have those contact tracers. Very early on, early March, we set up a hotline. We turned our drive-through flu clinics into a drive-through COVID testing clinic underneath the fairgrounds, people drive through, and we rely on others to help us. So Aviva provides our prime uh, person who does the swabbing is one of their dentists. They provide a lot of other things. The hospital has provided personnel. And so our COVID driving, drive-through testing has been live since uh, mid-March. And twice a week we do it, where I think we're the only public health that's been able to do it. And this has taken tremendous pressure off our local people to not have to do all the testing because we'll do all that testing. We do a daily press release. We do twice weekly Facebook Live sessions. And then we were obviously really involved in this countywide COVID task force. So, so preparation is really the key. Now, we're too late in this one for people to start preparing, but some of those models are really important. Work with your neighbors beforehand. If there are barriers that are going to cause competition or are going to cause hard feelings, get rid of those, get past those, and then practice working together. As people have said, an emergency is not the time to be collecting business cards. You got to know who these people are. You've got to work with these people beforehand so that you do it again. And by doing the free flu clinics, we garnered lots of positive public support from the from the people in the community and from the other workers that we were we were cooperators and that worked. So you saw in the beginning that Douglas County was going to be just a disaster for COVID. And the next slide will tell you exactly what happened. So you remember in the beginning there was a, a discussion that Douglas County would be one of the one of the four worst counties in the country. So uh, the four counties that were supposed to do really bad were Marion County in Florida, Highlands County in Florida, Mojave County in Arizona, and Douglas County in Oregon. So I pulled the numbers from these four counties uh, uh, a week or so ago. Marion County, 8,765 cases and 200 deaths. Uh, Highlands County, 1,854 cases and 69 deaths. Mojave County, 3,675 cases and 210 deaths. And Douglas County, 180 cases, uh, less than 10% of the number of cases of any of the other areas, and only three deaths, 20 times less than the best performing place. So yes, uh, when they predicted that these four counties would have troubles, they were right 75% of the time. I'll turn it over from here. Uh, Thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, um, I really want to emphasize that that things look pretty scary on the 25th of March, and um, we we were anticipating that the um, the system would be overwhelmed by Easter, and and really, uh, I, I think that Dr. Uh, Danahoff or Bob uh, was much too modest in the. Um, in the, the the impact, except for that last slide, which clearly shows that what we did made a difference in in our county. So, um, so I think it's important to understand that we maintained um, 
the ability to track down all of the contacts in what, what Dr. Bob would describe as containment throughout this entire process. We never lost the ability to do contact tracing and then to build the double ring um, uh, isolation around folks. So much of what we're gonna talk about here in this health system battle to manage the surge, we never had to implement and use. Let me repeat that. So, so because the public health battle was so effectively fought, we did a lot of planning and, and, and some people would say, well, you sort of wasted your time, Chip. Uh, but, uh, but I would say that what we have now is um, what, what Bob described with his flu clinics. We've exercised the systems. We know what people's strengths are. We know where the weaknesses lie. We know where si some of the, the rubs occur within the system. Would, would, you, would you say that, Tanvir? Uh, yes, absolutely. I would agree with that. Yeah, and and so let's go to the the next slide. And this this slide is a little bit complicated and difficult to understand. And maybe this is my psychopathology because I, I found this to be very informative to me in helping to to think about the system. So on on the left hand side, it talks about our planning factors. So this is the logic model that, that, that I created early on in that fog of war to say, what do we need to do to execute those six items that uh, Casey showed us on the, the big plan? So, so at the time when we were looking at this, we had data from, from Italy and we had data from New York City and, and you know we kind of had to come up with a, a planning factor. And so we thought there was a 72 hour doubling time for COVID infections. About 20% of those folks affected in our county would need hospitalization and 5% would need uh, intensive care. Our largest hospital in the community is uh, CHI Mercy Health, which is 170 beds, 16 ICU beds. And, and again, it's up here at the pinnacle of this pyramid as a fairly inelastic system. And, and so uh, we began talking with the CMO and the CEO of the hospital about what they were thinking they could do to expand. And one of the critical things to think about in a, a community is um, you probably have more resources than you believe, but eventually you will reach something that will be the constraint. So the initial constraint was 16 ICU beds, right? And, and then we came up with a plan to take over the surgery center and to, to expand ICU beds. And then the next constraint became ventilators. And the next constraint became train uh, individuals to run ventilators. And in each step along the process, folks came up with innovative ways to make that uh, uh, triangle at the top become more of the dotted um, circle. So we were able to expand the critical care capacity. Now there's there's still a maximum amount, but but it was much more than the 16 beds that the that the uh, horrible headline was predicated on. Anyone have anything to add on that? Okay. So so the 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 other thing is the the importance of the PPE. I think one of the guiding principles that I had was I never wanted to see pictures in the paper of our doctors, nurses, EMS folks wearing garbage bags and having bandanas tied across their face as the best PPE that we could provide. And so, so um, Dr. Bob did not talk about the fact that, that he was able to suit up for these um, drive-through uh, events in Pappers and Tyvek suits because we had a limited number of providers, we could um, provide the best possible uh, PPE for those folks. And then the N95 masks and those sorts of things could be preserved for the hospital. We encouraged all of the um, primary care practices to stop doing things that caused aerosolization. And we, we emphasized uh, doing PPE that was appropriate for that care. So, so that kind of looks at the top and then at the bottom, um, uh, of our, our pyramid. The other things we did was when, when surgery stopped, we increased the amount of available space within the hospital on the general inpatient wards, but we also were able to reach out to our local VA hospital and ask them to um, create an intermediate care ward. 
And they were able to do magnificent work changing from about a, a 10 bed uh, inpatient unit to um, uh, 30 beds with staffing for people who weren't COVID, uh, who, who were able to be in uh, a, a different setting. So still within a hospital. If you could just flip to the next slide, slide we'll come back to this one. But so, so all of these things that we talk about as far as the plan have to be put down into objectives that can be handed to the constituent organizations. So if you look at, at what we talked about originally in our planning, the hospital was given these objectives and said, can you do this? And, and so protecting patient staff, um, PPE based on risk and availability, they did a magnificent job moving to reusable um, gowns, um, uh, masks in places where it wasn't vital, preserving the um, uh, N95 masks for those uh, places where it was necessary. Um, uh, they uh, also took on the role of the centralized COVID diagnostic center through a hospital affiliated uh, urgent care center. The idea being we didn't have available testing. We needed to have a standardized case definition and, um, and to be able to, to, to make the best use of our resources. And then, and then um, I think it's worth looking at the bottom here about this intermediate care ward for the VA because it exemplifies sort of the emergency management system. So all emergencies are local. And, and in order to activate more resources, you have to go up through the incident command structure, which for us is Douglas County and then up to the state. And so if we wanted to use the local VA, which is two, two miles away from Mercy Medical Center, we, we went over and we talked to them and they said, yeah, we've got this space, we'd like to use it, they'd like to help you use it. Then we had to send a request all the way up to FEMA through the state it went across in Washington, D.C. from FEMA to the VA. It went through the headquarters at the VA back down to um, the uh, local VA. They said yay or nay. And then it went back up across at, at uh, Washington, D.C. and back down through the, the state to, to us to be able to say yes. Um, after 9-11, I was the medical director for the Navy Medicines Homeland Security. And so, so I would say that, that finding resources, if, if I hadn't known about this, we would have relied on our emergency management person. But, but my counsel to communities would be to, to go ahead and, and use those resources and to, to know who to ask. That's, that's why you have an emergency management person. So. Um, in the interest of time, let's go to the next slide. So I could spend a lot of time talking about the planning we did. This is a replication of that triangle um, with the various uh, components. Uh, I don't intend for us to go through all of this. I just wanted to give you an example of all of the different organizations that we brought together in, in part of the operations was mostly just keeping the lines of communication um, intact. Would, would you say that's true, Casey? Yeah, yeah. totally. And, and in fact, some of the, I think that was the biggest gap at the start. We started an informal, uh, which became formal um, daily call. And, you know, we we're all figuring out Zoom and that sort of stuff at the start of it, of, of how we would talk to each other. And I reached out to players I knew in the community to see if they would join that call just so we could try to gather situational awareness, which is very important when things are going really fast and the fog of war, as Chip said. And uh, that actually has morphed into now a routine uh, medical meeting on Wednesdays where we just do a check in. So it still survives that initial kind of, hey, let's talk and see what each other's doing. So, yes, reaching out and Communication is critical. Can, can Beer, do you do you have anything to add about the communication and tying the pieces together? Can Beer, um, uh, uh, is sort of an expert in community outreach and in connecting the dots. He he helped us to solve issues of transportation for our population that wouldn't have transportation to the urgent uh, care center and and a variety of other things.
Anything to add, Tander? Um, I think uh, Chip uh, and Casey have um, laid it out very nicely. Um, it was a very difficult period uh, for everyone in Douglas County, and I think uh, all the partners and stakeholders came together at the right time in the right way. But there was a lot of work that was involved in getting them together, and that's uh, the high point. Right. So, so with that, you know, I would just point out um, several of the things here that may not be as apparent from the previous slide. So. Over here on the, the right hand side of the slide, we had this planned alternative care site. We never activated that. We never had a need um, for uh, doing uh, care for individuals who could be safely cared for at home, but who didn't have a safe home in which to provide that care. We um, did a lot of work with telehealth and leveraged some of our larger organizations down at the bottom of the, the screen to help a bunch of small private practices, too many to list on this uh, slide uh, with being able to care for their patients safely at home. And, and that was a large part of those daily calls was trying to identify what was what was the need? What were we hearing from the um, primary care folks and from the hospitals? And how could we put resources to help meet that need? And every day the mission changed a little bit such that that in the midpoint, we we determined that the VA could potentially help us with doing N95 mask decontamination. And so we were able to expand our capabilities through preserving of PPE beyond where we thought we were gonna be, because at that point, PPE became one of the limiting factors. So, so it was an evolving process, and I, I cannot speak highly enough for our county commissioners, and for all the individuals uh, at each of the organizations who who stepped up to the plate, I'd like to transition over to um, uh, Tanvir, and he's got one more slide, and then we'll we'll close out with uh, words of wisdom from our incident commander. Thank you, Chip. Uh, I will just um, lay out um, the complexity that we faced uh, and sum up. Everything that Casey and uh, Chip and Bob has uh, shared today, uh, it, as any society, Douglas County in itself was a, is a very complex society, and to uh, put a, a program or a project in place to mitigate something like a pandemic in this case is a huge undertaking. And uh, there were several systems which all came together. And the medical system, the political system, uh, and also the social system, which was really important. Um, the role of the coordinating care organization, which I represent, Amqua Health Alliance, was to basically support uh, our surge management process and, and also uh, make sure that we use all our levers in our associations and partnerships to support the political, medical, and the social system. The social system includes the media, by the way. And uh, we were engaging with the social system with daily press releases. And we even had uh, a press conference uh, with everyone within our team uh, answering questions from the media. And that was really important for trans from a transparency perspective for the social system to stabilize and understand uh, the processes and the actions which were being taken to mitigate uh, the pandemics and uh, the COVID infection in general. The medical system was under stress because they, they were on the front line, the primary care, uh, to mitigate, um, to keep their staff safe, to keep the patients safe from the infection uh, as they went through their routine work. Uh, similarly, the hospitals, Mercy Medical and Lower Amqua, which is based on the coast, we had these two major hospitals and working very closely with our VA hospital partner in Roseburg. They had the same um, crisis management around mitigation. Uh, the political system also came into play, as uh, Chip mentioned, and uh, the political system also played a major role with, uh, with helping uh, the mitigation process. The key areas where my organization, the care co uh, the coordinating um, care organization, uh, 
came into uh, play was to help uh, from a financial standpoint, from a data collection and data sharing standpoint, and also uh, helping our primary care clinics sustain uh, their operations from a financial standpoint, because uh, based on fee-for-service, all of that uh, normal routine work came to a standstill uh, with the uh, COVID uh, restrictions. And we had to make sure that they were financially supported so they could um, provide uh, services through telehealth. And uh, that all, all went very well eventually. So I will hand it back over to Chip for final words. Thanks, Tanvir. I, I have no final words and I'll pass it over to Casey Bolton, our insight commander, who, who does a, a, a very nice job of helping to um, keep us on the same page and to, to remind us of where we've been and where we're going. And I, I think that that's really uh, a very important factor because I don't think this is our last um, time that we'll have to pull out this booklet that we've created about the response and dust it off and figure out how we're going to, you know, to move forward. And um, I, I have suspicions that this will rear its head again in the fall and winter and we will be needing to, to, to reconvene. But um, in my experience, you have to have breathers and, and let the system uh, uh, rest and, um, and then go back to, to full-time operations if we need to. So, Casey, would you, would you give us words of wisdom and then we'll move on to questions? Yeah, um, where's, how much time do we have, by the way? I wanna make sure I'm mindful of that. Are we good? Two minutes, yeah. Two minutes, all right. So, um, can we go to the next slide? So, you know, these things that I would talk about as far as pre-crisis, crisis, and post-crisis would be best to be done over beers with each other somewhere, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, the lessons learned, but I, I, I think we've already talked some of these points, and, and I just want to highlight a few of them in each one of these phases of, of the operation. But, uh, you know, understanding workflows is absolutely critical. And you, you need to take time pre-crisis. And Bob had, and his team had done a lot of that. But then when you add new players to the mix, that does change the, the workflow. And so you need to uh, be mindful of that and understand that. And, and with that last bullet in the pre-crisis of understanding what each organization can do and can't do and, you know, have it be aligned with what they can do. During the crisis piece, to be honest, I felt like there were some folks, and it doesn't matter who, but didn't quite understand that tipping point and the speed of action that needed to happen, at least initially based on those planning factors that Dr. Taylor mentioned. Uh, you know, you know doubling every 72 hours and so on. So you, you got to educate folks, you got to get them out of that business as usual mode and get them moving on. And again, aligning the mission with who's best support to pull it off. The other thing I would say is you got to translate all these things since everyone on this team is like, you know, incredibly educated, certified, credentialed, et cetera, but you're talking to elected officials, you're talking to the public. So you've got to translate those things out of doctor speak and whatnot. And I spent my entire military career doing that, translating medical and doctor into warfighter. And so I use a lot of that as we talk and try to, you know, I don't want to say dumb it down, that's not it at all, but using the, the right language so it, it would communicate what needed to for those decision makers. Lastly, you know, success is not just that your plan worked. And, you know, there's always going to be a letdown when you, you work hard and, you, and you, the team just gels and then, you know, it kind of pitters out or whatever. But if the plan didn't need to be used, that's also success. And we have it and we can go back to it. The relationships that we built in that process still are strong and we still talk to each other. Um, the other thing I would say is understand the dynamic and because the, the truth is a moving target with regards to how you need to respond to this. 
So you need to have thresholds and triggers of when you need to go back to a higher posture of action or coordination. And like Dr. Taylor said, you know, you've got to kind of you got to pace yourself, sprint, and then walk. And and so right now we're really not really tracking the cases, at least I'm not as much as I am hospitalizations at, at our local hospitals for COVID and then people presenting into the urgent cares for COVID-like symptoms, really trying to understand that. That and the PPE are the, are the focus, not numbers on a, on that uh, maybe isn't the right thing to track, in my opinion, as a medical planner. And I think that is our last slide. And I would turn it over to Betsy, I think. Or, or, or Rose. One, I think Rose. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chip, Bob, Casey, Conveer, and Betsy. We will now go to the question and answer portion of this session. Thank you. So good morning. Thank you all so much for that that presentation, and and happy Veterans Day to our to our veterans here. Um, many questions have have come in as as this session has um, progressed. So we'll just go ahead and get started. This is a general one, and and any of you all can hop in and answer it. Um, how do you recommend working together to address different information coming from different sources, different but still reliable sources? Uh, thoughts on that? And don't forget to unmute yourself and turn your camera on. Dr. Bob, you want to take that? Sure, I'll, I'll take that first so people can hear me. I think, again, to have pre existing relationships really helps. So, drilling in non emergent times first is really the key. So, we could, we could have make mistakes. Uh, there was really no pressure to do this. To do the first time under pressure is hard. So, any of us who've ever played in sports or have been in theater would think it would be crazy for us to put the show on without a dress rehearsal or to start the season without practice. Similarly, uh, um, preparedness is a team sport. I think uh, as, uh, Tanvir, I would add, go ahead, Tanvir. Add a little to what Bob said. And uh, recently we've been um, briefed by the Oregon Health Authority uh, on this specific area of information sharing and specifically data sharing. It seems that when we put our plan together, the amount of data coming in was not that was not that much. Specifically, I'm referring to testing. So a lot of testing that is happening right now uh, is in different um, sectors. So some of the testing is free. So documentation of that and then sharing of that information is critical. Uh, for um, subsequent uh, uh, use of that information for processes like, um, uh, you know, uh, checking and case uh, case checking, uh, which our public health does in a very nice way. So the, the whole point is how to integrate that all these different data streams. Uh, California has a, a model which they used during the recent fire um, period that happened there and obviously it infected us also. And they were using geospatial satellite information and uh, making geo mapping of Pacific areas where people were affected and then reaching them. But that could be one of the way that information could be integrated and then used effectively uh, for uh, public health response. Katie, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, it's not very profound, so I'll just hang tight. <laughs> okay, well, since we did have another question in the same vein, so um, how do you think these relationships that you've all established that um, everybody seems to be, you know, very impressed with the, the coordinated effort, how will these relationships impact your future collaborations? And where might you see strong relationships continue? And I know you weighed in on that one a little bit, Casey. Anybody else have anything to add? Well, I think um, I can speak to that just a little bit. Uh, 
we've had a surge in Douglas County. I was listening to my my uh, talk and it was a little prescient. We were going to have to dust this off again. Um, we've already begun talking. Uh, Casey is in contact with the county commissioners. Dr. Bob has been helping us to 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 get our situational awareness up to speed and he's busily recruiting more people for contact tracing. And, um, and, you know, I stopped by and visited with the CMO at the hospital to touch bases about how our brand new family medicine residents might play a role in, in helping with the manpower stuff. So, um, you know, the beauty about being in a rural community is that, you know, it doesn't take much to build those relationships. It also doesn't take much to destroy those relationships. And, and so, um, you know, we, I think we've done a good job of nurturing those and keeping them alive. And, and I, I don't sense the same anxiety at this point in time. And I don't see that as complacency. I see that as um, maybe we've reached that sense of we, we have the competence, we know what we're facing, and, and we have the confidence that we have the abilities to, to respond. I, I'd be interested in hearing what some of the other folks think. I, I, I'm, I'm in clinic right now, so I haven't been able to talk with these folks in a little while. Well, the only thing we can be sure about is that we're going to need to do this again, be it another pandemic, be it Cascadia, be it something else that we're going to need to work together again on the emergency side. But then there's other positive things we can work on. So I had talked earlier about obesity or other kind of things. And so this cements relationships that later will help when we work on a project, say immunizations with the CCO or smoking cessation with the CCO. And, and again, building relationships is, is really important, much easier rural community, I think, than say in Portland. Yeah, I would just comment briefly. I, I feel like it's transformed the relationships, uh, the, you know, not letting a crisis go to waste. We really do have a much better uh, system of cross-talking in the community and, and understanding who the real the real people are to make things happen. You know, Tanvir uh, blazed so many trails for us with the CCO and, and has kept those doors open. Uh, you know, each one of the people that are on this panel was instrumental in sustaining that uh, mosaic of crosstalk. So, So, so again, back to this this information piece, and and I think a big thing that's come up in in a lot of places, especially in the media and whatnot. What do you all do when you have differences and recommendations, say between the CDC or or OHA? How do you address that? And you guys did mention that you're doing um, daily press releases and Facebook Live. Is is are those mechanisms that you're using at all? Yes. Yeah, so yes. we're doing those twice. We're doing those twice a week. And uh, a lot of the, a lot of what we address is the cacophony that's out there, uh, different recommendations for masks, different recommend recommendations for just basic disease control. And we go through it and say, you know, this is our, we always, we always explain that this is our first pandemic, that nobody knows this, that it's going around quickly, and ask people not to use those small differences in in rules as a sense that we don't know what we're doing, is that we don't know exactly what we're doing, but we're pretty much know. You know, I we, we try to have lots of humility in this, something that's been lacking perhaps at the federal level. So if I could just tag team on that, I, I saw Angela's question and tried to respond in the chat. Uh, I, th I think the way that we handled it, so talking about our experience is that we, we had a lot of behind the scenes con conversations and then tried to speak with one voice. And I think that's really important. We also had a very trusted source and, and Dr. Bob is a local uh, 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 celebrity uh, <laughs> for his uh, uh, funny videos on masks and a variety of other things. And so, so uh, it, it, isn't e it isn't easy to stay on task. And so, um, you know, being able to say, we, we weren't quite right on that. Here's what we see today. Um, you know, so we, we were wrong with the 72 hour doubling time and, uh, and and we had to adjust fire and and go from there. So I, I hope that answers the question. 
Beautiful. I, I think that's I think that's exactly what we're after here. So before we wrap this session up, I know that we recorded this session a, a bit ago, and there's a great deal of interest in what you all are doing now as cases are surging. Um, is your system holding steady, or so what's going on with with your um, with, with with the process that you described in your session and and how that's being implemented at the moment? Well, we clearly are seeing a surge. So uh, when we tape this, we now have about three times as many cases and three times as many deaths. So it really has surged since then. But actually, all of the work that we had done early on has just served us perfectly well. So, for example, we had a press conference yesterday at the fairgrounds. It was totally on on task. Uh, we are certainly getting stretched now with what goes on, but I think we have enough built up social capital in the system that I think people are listening to us and and helping us during this difficult time. But I would tell for anybody who's out there, this is going to be a very difficult next eight weeks. Yeah, I would just I would just say the the emergency operations set there's tension between uh, kind of an, an immediate response mode and then sort of a sustained operations piece. And so we we uh, although things are more more right now, uh, we really have a good uh, lid on how the team works together um, going forward. And so, actually, Dr. Gray, our the hospital CMO, it has elevated to be probably the key him and Bob of making sure we're all marching in the same direction. Um, you know. Notwithstanding all the other variables, you know, those two leaders really say this is these are the boundaries. And then what I'm doing now is trying to pull in resources and connect the dots and get ahead of them a little bit. Um, but uh, you know, the full county might of this is, is trying to do multiple things at once, and you, you know, life goes on. You know, so you've got and they have county stuff they have to do, so we don't have the EOC fully up right now, but it's virtually up to you us kind of check in. Uh, this is Tanvir, and I just wanted to add as far as uh, system stability is concerned, uh, I think the biggest risk right now for rural um, areas uh, is that the systems can become unstable very quickly. If uh, the ICU beds, for example, uh, the, the metro areas run out of the ICU capacity. So if that happens and rural area has capacity, so we will be asked uh, to support some of those patients will be transported here in the rural areas. So that'll be the biggest risk, which could make the systems really unstable very quickly. Great point, Tanvir. Thank you. So we are just about to the top of the hour and our next session is going to begin. So I want to thank everybody um, for sharing their expertise today. Tanvir, Chip, Bob, Betsy, uh, Casey. Um, you guys have been absolutely tremendous. Thank you so much. Um, and we're going to keep uh, this veterans topic going. And our next session is going to be, out, be about engaging rural veterans and growing community partnerships. So. A nice transition here and I want to thank you all for joining us today and, and listening to how our communities are supporting these efforts. Thank you very much and have a lovely remainder of the conference.